much and, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to, to all of you. We are looking forward to, to presenting our paper uh, quite uh, briefly. And just to introduce ourselves, my name is Thomas Schlag, Professor for Practical Theology at the Faculty of Zurich. And welcome as well from my side. My name is Sabrina Müller and I'm the Managing Director of the University Research Priority Program on Digital Religions, where Thomas is the Director. So I will share our presentation and hand it first over to you, Thomas. Yes, before you share or you just oh. shared, uh, we just wanted to uh, give you some attention on the holiday mode we are almost in and we wish you also a very nice summer holidays showing you some slides from um, the Swiss uh, countryside and landscape and the city. Okay, and now um, you see the title and just to, to, as, a, as a start, uh, Heidi started saying we would maybe present some results of our churches online in times of Corona study. We, we, we are actually not prepared for doing that. I, I just like to um, remind you of our website, www.contoc.org. And there you find uh, some first preliminary results on that study about the churches in times of Corona. And we are just about to publish two volumes, one in German, one in English. Uh, about these results in the nearer future. Right, <clears throat> now starting our presentation, I just would like to, to, to connect that presentation to, to two major questions uh, that are raised in this uh, uh, section this afternoon. And, and I would call it like that, uh, can methods be theological at all? That would be the first question. And if so, in which sense? Uh, and the second question, is there something like a specific profile of digital research done by theologians? Well, we see about that. So we, we try to explain a little bit about our current research in this field. And this is the structure of our presentation. We start by uh, giving you some um, ideas about uh, the logics of transformation. So we will pick up the term of transformation more in detail. Uh, the second will be uh, some insights into our empirical study on the network, the heart network. And finally, we draw some conclusions um, under the term of digital communication as network theology. That's the structure for the next minutes. Okay, just to very also briefly start with logics of transformation. Uh, and of course, our digital research as theologians is from right from the start, a very interdisciplinary one. So if we speak of transformation, it might make sense to look into the use of this term in other disciplines beyond theology. And if you look into that, this is really in the, in the sense of, of, of a model uh, you find in the social, social, political and cultural sciences, you find the use of transformation as a, a description of changes of certain frameworks and conditions, and also of new patterns and actions. Uh, you also, of course, are very aware of the use of transformation within the ecological situation. We have a very desperate situation in Switzerland, Germany right now. You've probably heard about the, the flood and this incredible situation, so please pray for our countries. Um, but uh, on a more scientific level, you find ecological in that um, research, uh, you find um, the use in, in, in the sense of counter steering transformative change processes. And of course, a transformation is used in a very global perspective. And finally, on a psychological and philosophical level, um, it is understood and the term is used uh, um, uh, when, whenever uh, changes are described of certain state of consciousness and or cognition uh, and a change of identity of a person or also the identity of groups and um, other formations within society. Now to come to the theological dimension of transformation, and this is probably a possible approach of us as theologians. Uh, it, it, I think it's, it, it's very useful to start with the, um, well, reminding you of, of Luke 17 and, and of course many other uh, biblical references, the kingdom of, the, of God as, as, as a core 
issue or core focus of uh, the idea of transformation in, in, in the theological dimension. It includes an earthly and a transcendent dimension. We heard that this in, in this very fascinating uh, beginning of this afternoon's meeting with, with the biblical reflections. Um, it's always about divine authorship. It's always in the sense of a resonant space to come back to our uh, discussion from yesterday. It's always included, or it's always, always connected with a human response. <clears throat> and therefore it has a passive and an active uh, dimension of intertwining of these uh, three dimensions with this uh, core focus. So now the question has to be raised what the individual and the community of believers uh, and how and if they are, could be called and empowered to bring this transformative power to light, to, to put it in these words. Okay, I will take over and just say a few words about the Instagram account we actually looked at. Um, and we're at the moment often observing and doing participant observation on different in Instagram accounts, especially from pastors and church accounts. So this account is the, how Thomas said, the Heart Network or the Herz Network, Netzwerk. And it's founded by a pastor of the North Church, North Kirche. So it's still a state church there, Josephine Teske. And um, it's a project, and that's how what it says there in German, it's a project created by everyone who wants to tell and share about faith. So no matter how, when, and with what experience. So this account was actually created to create, uh, to make, or to, to give a platform to talk and share about faith. And just to say, uh, Josefine Teske is one of the big influencers and Thomas um, presented yesterday one of our book chapters exactly on the question of the influences. So she has nearly 28,000 followers now as a pastor, which is in our context actually a high number. So um, what it says as well, this network is from all of us and for all of us, and they want to be um, the next want to be part of the digital church. So this network is planned to be digital church and it has just under 7,000 followers at the moment. What we did is we looked at a series that was started in the network last November <coughs> and it was on lust, death and mourning. And um, they had different parts about this, like losing a child or um, suicide and so on. What we looked at was the question on songs. They asked for what are comforting songs for you? And in this, um, in this section, they had 100 comments. The part is that many things actually in this network ha happen in the stories, but we looked at the comments there because we didn't have the access to all the stories. Um, what we did is we took the comments and we just coded them. It was inductive content analysis, just a screenshot from Max Kudea, which is a program we often work with. And what you see here is that from coding those hundred comment, comments and looking as well at the songs they posted, there were three main categories. One was death, a funeral, then the other one was the meaning of the songs, and the third was the theological interpretation. And then we look first at the death funeral. There you, we saw, you see three logics actually. Um, the song gets much more important and is much often shared when the song was played at a funeral. And often this is in combination with the phrase died too soon or someone died young. Or the other discourse part that people talk and share is <clears throat> your own funeral. And the logic you see there is that it's often, um, as soon as it comes to your funeral, they want to play happy songs. Opposed to the other at the, at the funeral service, you see very um, like sad or deep songs. And the meaning of songs when you look what they share and what the songs mean, you have again three 
main codes. So one is support of emotions. The songs they share support the emotions, then they take it up and say, oh yes, I know this song, it supports me too. Or the other way, they talk about this song actually connects. It gives me connectedness to the dead person, to myself or to other grieving people. And it brings back memories and the memories of many different levels. And then the third part is actually the, what you call the theological interpretation. And there it's um, very important that the, um, how they interpret the death experience is what I call thoughts of heaven, because they use often very classical um, pictures, songs. They do combine pop songs and church songs, whatever, but um, heaven is a very huge part of this. So thoughts of heaven and interesting is that they share um, as well classical pictures of home, heaven, um, they are now by God or on the other hand of more like panentheistic or pantheistic pictures of that person is now here. Then interestingly, they use the songs in form of a creed, what, how they interpret um, life after death. And, and there they don't say, say by themselves, they use the, the song to communicate with other people. And a very important part is that those songs lead to everyday transcendence in the life of the people. So they, through playing the song and sharing those songs, they have transcendence experiences in those moments. So this transcendence can be again, again split up in three areas. It's the personal interpretation of this every day or of the songs. Um, like I feel a special moment or a power. It's, we talk about healing moments and then holiness or being touched is often something that is used. And one song that was often mentioned and that kind of brings all those thoughts together is one from Ed Sheeran and I just recorded 30 seconds and you will hear very classical. Okay, so um, through those songs, um, the songs give comfort, give hope, and they kind of bring a piece of eternity into the everyday. Um, one further way down now, um, on the interpretation or the theological interpretations, what we see is that there is a transformative, transformative communication dynamics, actually. The point is it's transformative in the communication patterns, but not in the content. So we have a difference there. When we look what is transformed, it's, and this is very well known in all the books, place and time. So that's what we all know. Um, what is well transformative is that stranger become friends through shared experiences. So this is more the personal side, but we have as well a more ecclesiological side. So the ecclesiological form gets transformed in the sense that you don't need to have a pulpit anymore to get, um, get the message or get, get um, support. People or lay people themselves give, give them um, um, give themselves the, the message of eternity, hope, or the gospel, or whatever. So that's what you see there. So we have a, a change of the hierarchies in those songs. Faith becomes part of the digital life of the people, and theology and religious content are part of a public digital practice, which they shared and which is openly accessible for all the people. And this leads us to the thought of this participatory network theology. And I hand over to you, Thomas. Yep. This is actually the final slide. Um, Sabrina mentioned the term participatory network theology already. And just to differentiate that term um, in this on this final slide, um, it includes, as we said, a transformative potential of Christian faith on different levels. It opens up new thing, new views of things or new views of practices like public discipleship. 
there is a, a very interesting intertwine also of visibility and invisibility. That would be an own issue to, to talk about and interpret uh, within these uh, social media platforms. And again, also of passivity and activity, which you could also take as a theological terms in the sense of grace and responsibility, for example. Okay, now this is the conclusion for the moment. The Instagram account we were looking at exemplarily and paradigmatically shows that digital communication possibilities open up a considerable transformative potential for the development of the self and the experience of transcendence. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Tomas and Sabrina. So um, without further ado, um, Nadia Delicata from uh, University of Malta, um, she will be responding to the, uh, their paper. So Nadia, um, over to you. Hi, um, thanks so much for the opportunity to respond to this paper. I found it very, very interesting. Uh, in many ways, I think the response will also reflect who I am. I think we cannot help but doing that when we engage as scholars. And uh, as Heidi said in the beginning, I mean, I'm a, I'm a Catholic theologian. My area of, of reflection tends to be more, what does it mean to be Christian and church in a digital context? So as you can imagine, it also comes from a bit of an ethics point of view and a theological ethics point of view. And I think when I read this paper, I was very much struck by, by the first part in particular, by this whole idea of transformation. And I really wanted to share some, some thoughts about that because then the rest, the rest of the research, I think, really shows um, how this challenge of transformation is, in fact, our challenge, our challenge as, as, uh, as people who at least claim to be Christians, claim to be baptized, are baptized. So I will also go through the three um, aspects. I will go in the same order. What strikes me the most about this whole idea of transformation, and in a sense, I think I wanted, I wanted to add my own take um, Thomas was saying that there are various ways how different traditions, how different um, constructs understand transformation. In a sense, I, I wanted to add the media ecological one, which is an, an area of interest of mine. And in many ways, media ecology, I think, simply assumes that change is inevitable. The very fact that you change the environment, the very fact that you have a new uh, configuration through new media, it means that change is, is inevitable and it is going to affect us. The whole idea of the medium is the message, is that the message becomes us reacting to the new environment created by, um, by anything that in fact originally we create. So this whole idea of transformation also has this passive dimension to it that is that change has a passive dimension to it. So in a sense, I wanted to emphasize the aspect of transformation that is more uh, our challenge and in many ways, our Christian challenge because we are also people who believe that the ultimate change has happened. And the ultimate change, of course, is, is salvation. That is what Christ brings into the world. And that salvation is what becomes enacted a bit at a time. And how does it become enacted a bit at a time? Precisely through what Thomas was, was describing in the beginning, which is our participation in the work of the spirit. And I think this is why I think the very word transformation, to me at least, theologically speaking, would evoke how as churches, as Christians, ours is in fact a responsibility for the transformation of culture. A transformation that I would describe in, in two terms that are somewhat analogous, somewhat analogous, but also distinct. One would be the humanization of culture and in our context of digital culture, because every culture has its own potentialities, potentialities and, and, and its own challenges. So what does it mean to humanize culture? I think that is a responsibility of the Christian. That is also, I think, a proper enculturation of the good news. How is the good news to be expressed in our particular context? So I was very intrigued to see then how regular Christians are in fact enacting this. And I was very struck by three three aspects that I that three things at least jumped to me from from your study on heart heart network. One is of course this whole idea of networking, but of course networking in and of itself, the primary question that one should ask is this kind of network humanizing 
is this kind of black network a more natural way of being human, natural in the positive sense, natural in the sense that it brings out our best. But then I was also struck by the whole idea that really came out strongly of sharing, but I got the sense from the paper without discourse. So there is this desire to share, yes, but perhaps not to, cha not to challenge each other too much and not to take it on the level of discourse too much. So to keep it more on the level of shared experience, which makes sense because of course experience and especially the experience of mourning and of, lo and of loss is precisely what we all have in common. But that tells me we are at step one and not at step two, three and four. And then there is also this whole idea of, of it becomes public. Personally, I question the whole public and private distinction. I think this is simply the fact that my own life now exists also online. And if it exists online, then of course, uh, the boundaries of the self can no longer be held by what before was conceived to be private. So I actually extend to the whole world. So to me, this private public, in a sense, it's like it's a simple outpouring of the self. Lastly, when it comes to the theological interpretation, I was very, very struck, like the researchers themselves, about how the images are classical, traditional. I dare call them um, the combination of the classical imagery of heaven, of angels, the alleluias, etc., together with this desire for nature, this pantheistic kind of um, uh, accent. To me, they almost seem nostalgic. I think nostalgic is, is, uh, is an interesting term that I would use uh, about this experience. And once again, I related to uh, what I mentioned before. Nostalgia, in a sense, is experiential. It is about we are existing in this new context of, of continuous, uh, of a continuous possibility of retrieval. So we are still in this process of retrieving, retrieving, retrieving. And in a sense, perhaps we are still not quite reflecting on how this new context challenges us to live differently. Uh, we are still on the level of experience if one had to interpret it from a, Loner, from a Bernard Donningham point of view. So we are at the level of experience, still struggling to understand, but how, what exactly to do with this as church, I suspect we are still not quite there yet. And I think there are, this is a moment where there is, there is in fact a challenge. Because the challenge could be that we either simply go with the flow, that is always the, the, you know, the temptation. You simply go with the flow. Just as culture moves in one direction, the church moves in the same direction and the church as people who are baptized, as those who are, you know, who, who, who must share the good news, we simply try and do it the way everybody else does. And of course that is bound to fail. But another way is, I think, to truly appropriate our vocation. And in that sense, I think we must also appropriate our vocation from the wisdom that we have appropriated from the tradition. One challenge of the moment when you have a network theology is, in fact, the conversation that we had a few years ago in another similar gathering to this, is that you have a huge challenge to authority. So at this point, everybody's opinion is, is necessary, is important. Everybody's experience is necessary, is important. But one must also engage in a proper process of dialogue where one then also needs to come to some decision of what this will actually mean for the well being of humanity as a whole. And there, one will need to distinguish between different opinions and different experiences. I think that is also our duty. And in a sense, that is precisely the challenge of transformation, of collaborating for a for a world that becomes um, truly more reflective in some way of the kingdom.